me, as like a kinetic formulator, I would prefer a product with, you know, just 0.1% madocasicide over like 80% central asiatica. For me, it does not say anything. For me, it actually says this brand is more about marketing than science. And uh, I do not feel that that it's, it's a claim that should be made. Welcome back to Unpacking Beauty. This podcast answers questions about the science, marketing, and trends in the beauty space. My name is Kelly Driscoll. I am the creator and host, and I'm also a skincare content creator on YouTube. Throughout my skincare journey, I have found the importance of deep diving into the ingredients list of a skincare product. If you watch my YouTube videos, you know that my content is very ingredient focused. I love deep diving into ingredients, why they work, what they do for the skin, and I love to see how an ingredients list come together. I know that that can only tell one part of the story about a skincare product. You always have to try it out. You have to feel it. You have to test it out on your skin to really know how it works. But starting with the ingredients list has been so helpful for me, especially with sensitive skin. I have been able to narrow down the ingredients that seem to bug my skin to cause sensitivity and irritation. And it has made me a much smarter consumer. And it has also made me a smarter skincare reviewer as well. And so I knew I wanted to cover the topic of ingredients list on Unpacking Beauty. What can we tell from an ingredients list? What can't we tell from an ingredients list? And so I was so thrilled when I got a yes from Judith Rotz. She is a computer scientist, a cosmetic chemist, the co-founder of Geek and Gorgeous, and the creator of InkeyDecoder.com. You may be familiar with this website because it's one of the most popular ingredient databases on the internet today and one of my favorite resources for researching ingredient lists. With Judith's vast experience with cosmetic chemistry, creating an ingredient database, and formulating the products for Geek and Gorgeous, we talk all about ingredients today, what the list can tell us, what are some shady red flags to look out for, how we can use the ingredients list to check up on the marketing claims of a product, and we also do a little bit of a mini deep dive into plant extracts and why it's a bit of a pet peeve of Judith's how plant extracts aren't really standardized and a lot of the percentage claims around plant extracts don't really mean much. I actually found it really fascinating. It's a topic I've been interested in for a while and I know quite a few of you are also very interested in plant extracts and so we break it down in today's conversation. So without further ado, I am so excited to welcome Judith Rotz to Unpacking Beauty. Judith Rutz, welcome to Unpacking Beauty. How are you doing? Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Good, thanks. Great. I am so excited to have you on the show because I'm a really big fan of Inky Decoder. It's actually a source that I use for a lot of my research, looking into products and learning about ingredients and just getting a feel for, um, you know, what is out there um, and what makes up an ingredient list. So I'm very excited to chat with you about this subject because this is something that you're obviously very passionate about. For listeners and watchers who maybe are not familiar with InkyDecoder.com, or your work. Can you just give us a short introduction to who you are, why you got into skincare, and um, about your website as well? Yeah, so uh, my name is Judith, uh, and uh, so I got into skincare, uh, a similar story to probably many others. I really had severe acne uh, in high school and during university and, you know, trying out many things and eventually, you know, taking Rakuten and, and all the usual stuff. And uh, after a while, I was just really, uh, for a while, I was trying things randomly. And, you know, after like five years, it finally occurred to me that maybe I should be a bit more <clears throat> methodical and research skincare properly. And we are talking about like 15 years ago. So at the time there was Paula Begon pretty much uh, as the OG skin influencer. And I found yeah. her work and I, I really loved it and learned a lot from her. And uh, so after a while, uh, I decided that there is nothing. So I am from a small European country. It's called Hungary, basically. And, uh, and there was nothing in, in this small country. There was literally nothing about skincare on the internet like 15 years ago. So I started here a review website and an ingredient analyzer website 
like a two in one. And after after a year or two, it became really popular here, and um, it, it was eventually bought by a me- big media company. It is still today like the most popular beauty website here in my country. And uh, basically, in English, so Inky Decoder is basically like an evolution of the Hungarian side, but. I was thinking there are so many good review sites out there, so I, I do not see the need to, to do one in English. But I was feeling that uh, a site that looks at ingredient lists, uh, maybe what I did uh, uh, in the Hungarian website could be useful even in English. And of course, I learned a lot, so maybe I could make it even better. And and that's how I started in Key Decoder, I think six or seven years ago. So it, it's not new. <laughs> it's um such an amazing resource and uh, similar to you when I was first getting into skincare about 10 years ago the only resource for really deep diving into specific ingredients was the polish choice ingredient like dictionary which is super helpful but there are limitations to that um and what I really love about your site is that you can just copy and paste any ingredient list right into the decoder and it will break down every single ingredient you can click on each individual individual one, figure out what they are for, what's their purpose. It can really go a long way to, to getting a basic understanding of, of maybe what, how the product might perform. Obviously there's limitations, right? But it it gives us a lot of information, um, for just basic consumers. So those of you listening, if you haven't checked it out, but you're interested in learning a little bit more, it is, I think it's such a helpful tool. And I saw you, uh, describe it as something like, uh, makeup alley, uh, like verse, like meets that like polished choice ingredient dictionary. And I think that that is exactly like what it is it's a very very helpful um source so i studied computer science originally so i kind of and then eventually i studied cosmetic science as well later on so i feel like inky decoder mixes that so we really wanted to put an amazing technology so that you really can put in any ingredient list even if it's like crappy no uh, commas or anything to separate the thing and we still parse it surprisingly well so yeah i am really proud of the technology we we developed uh behind yeah. that it's super helpful. And I have to say, I mean, like, I, I'm not like fangirling you a little bit, but like, I love that you can take an image of an ingredients list and decode from an image instead of just from text. Because sometimes, especially I'm super into Korean skincare. And so sometimes those ingredients lists, like you don't have like a text-based ingredients list. It's like an image base. So I can take a screenshot of that and, and upload it to the site and it will decode the ingredients list for me so much easier than if I was to sit there and try to type everything out. I've also, I have to say, I've used it in hard to read like boxes of skincare, like when I'm at the store and I, it's like gray text on like a white background. I'm like, who's going to be able to see this tiny text, but I take a picture of it and I upload it to the site. And then all of a sudden I have a really easy to, to read, um, font and everything for the ingredients list. So I, yes, it is so much more than just like a database of ingredients. It is actually a very user-friendly tool. I think for anybody can use it. It's so easy. Yeah, thanks so much. So happy to hear this. So I wanted to have you on to talk about ingredients lists because I think that that is something um, I am definitely interested in. A lot of the content that I put out is based on kind of helping to break down ingredients and and how things work together. And so I wanted to have you on because you have this background in creating this this database and this tool for breaking down ingredients lists with your computer science background, but you also have a um, degree in cosmetic chemistry as well. So you have a good understanding of of the ingredients and how they can play together. So the first question that I wanted to ask you is um, when we're looking at an ingredients list, what are the main things that just at looking at the ingredients list that we can tell about that product just from looking at the ingredients without trying it? Yeah, so the main thing is probably that if you have any allergies or any problem or you want to avoid an ingredient for for any reason, you can just check, obviously, if it's there or not. I think this is the reason ingredients must be written legally on on a product. But other than that, you can also take the opposite. Like, you know, you want, a, I don't know, a nice cinnamite product or then you can just check 
is it there? So that's like the basic level. And I think above that, it a bit depends also on your knowledge and understanding of skincare. I think that the more you know, then probably the more useful information you can tell from the ingredient list. So, um, and it can be often product specific. Like for example, if there is a vitamin C serum, then now it's vitamin C is so fashionable. Every product is written vitamin C, uh, but it can be a lot of derivatives and it can mean really a lot of things. So um, it's a good idea, I think, to, to just check the ingredient list, see which is the specific type or sunscreens is, is also a good example. I personally always love to check the exact filters because I know my, my preferences. Um, and then, uh, for example, we, we do a site like Inky Decoder, we just list the filters separately for you really easily. Um, but also, I think you can do like a, a basic check about the marketing claim. It's like if it's a, an anti anti aging moisturizer and you only see like glycerin and hyaluronic acid, then you can know it's probably more just a normal moisturizer. Uh, but if you see there, I don't know, peptides and stuff like that, then you can understand, okay, it's probably more than just a basic moisturizer. So yeah, well, this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I have found it very helpful, you know, diving into ingredients it's been very helpful to figure out what does int doesn't agree with my skin and of course what does agree with my skin and that takes time um but it's it's very helpful to get comfortable just kind of scanning an ingredients list if you do have ingredient sensitivities um because now i know what to avoid um especially as somebody who does test so many skincare products it really helps me avoid potential irritants um it makes me a little bit more successful at my job makes me my skin a lot happier too. Um, so it's, it, it can be very helpful to tell what's not in a product. But I think as you mentioned as well, if you get familiar with active ingredients or ingredients that you know you like and that you know do well for your skin, it's very easy to be able to pick that out and get an idea if you're going to be successful with a given um, product just by looking at the ingredients list. Now, the thing about that is there's a lot of things we cannot tell about skincare by just looking at the ingredients list. So can you um, tell us a few things that um, we can't tell about a product when we're looking at ingredients? Yeah, so I feel that it kind of became like very fashionable to, you know, like look at the ingredient list and think that you can just add everything from there. And then people start to say, no, actually there are so many things you cannot tell. It's almost like no point in looking at the ingredient list. And, uh, you know, like obviously me <laughs> uh, being passionate about looking ingredient list, I, I really feel that that's also very much not true. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's kind of like looking at a menu where, where they list that, okay, it, it's a pasta with chicken and they maybe say the exact type of pasta and chicken and they say if it's cream or tomato and then you get a basic idea, but you will not know exactly how it tastes or for a cosmetic product, you will not know exactly how it feels on your skin unless you really try it. Uh, you will not know the exact efficacy of the product uh, unless you try it though if it's a sunscreen product or anti-aging product you might even not know it even if you try it so it's a really complicated question um and yeah there are these nuances like uh, what's the source of the ingredient i don't know is it organic or even if it's not a plant extract but just like a glycol for example glycols used to always come from petrochemicals but now they it can also come from plants and um, renewable sources and it's the exact same molecule and you know it's just written there pentyl and glycol um and i don't know if someone is interested into that these are things you have to just ask the brand uh, if they are willing to give you that information um yeah so there are plenty you you cannot know and plenty that you can know uh, i think 
Yeah, I think uh, nuance was a great word that you used there. Uh, it definitely, there is nuance and to just look at an ingredients list is not going to tell the full story of a product. I have seen a lot of um, skincare content creators and reviewers talk about products that they've never actually touched, but they just look at the ingredients list and say, this is good, this is bad or, or whatnot, right? And, um, you know... It, it can tell us a little bit, right? But I think that we're, we're fundamentally missing a lot of information by just reading the ingredients list because, as you said, it's not going to tell us about consistency and texture if it's right for our skin type. Um, I have used products where I look at the ingredients list. I'm like, I don't know about this. Like, I don't like these ingredients. I don't think they work for my skin. But I will go through a testing process with the product and be like, surprisingly, you know, on paper, this wasn't supposed to work out, but actually it works. So it's not just about cherry picking individual ingredients. It's about how things come together. That's chemistry. And we can't tell that by just looking at the ingredients list. I love the analogy about like the food. We get a basic idea, but we don't know the quality and and, and all of that. And I think you also brought up a great point about um, the origin of the ingredients or maybe the quality. Um, we don't know where that, that ingredient was sourced. We don't know um, the quality of said ingredient. Um, and there's a lot of, as you mentioned, nuances to that as well. So something that you've written about on uh, Inky Decoder is about plant extracts and how like the percentage claims of plant extracts are impossible to interpret unless it's like a standardized plant extract. So as I mentioned, I'm super into K-Beauty products. They rely heavily on plant extracts um, and they do make a lot of claims around like you know 70 percent centella so i would love for you to kind of expand on the topic of, of plant extracts i'm super interested in this um, and you know what is a standardized plant extract why are plant extracts like a murky area in skincare yeah i'm so happy for this question because <laughs> I really feel it's like a pet peeve of mine and I feel that no one is talking about it and I'm not exactly sure why. Um, yeah, so so the thing with plant extracts is that they are really not well defined just by their ingredient name. So so let's take as an example Centella Asiatica because it's such a well-known plant. And there are so many products claiming even 100% Centella Asiatica mm -hmm. extracts uh, or, I don't know, 80%. And it's just um, you don't really know what you are getting. It's if it's such a high percentage, then it has to be basically water. So then maybe the plant was, you know, soaked in water for X days and then what came out of it is the product. But uh, you, you can't know and you do not know if it really contains any significant amount of the active components. So uh, in every plant, plant or the plants that are better studied and Centella is definitely one of those. Um, we kind of know which are the biologically active components and molecules. And for Centella, the main one is called Madacasticide. Uh, but the, there is also, is, there are four main ones. So Madacasticide is, in my opinion, number one, but also, uh, okay, I don't know by heart, but uh, I do. <laughs> you know, okay. Yeah. Madagascicide, madagascic acid, asiatic acid, and asiaticide. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, so those four are the active components. And you know, it's not to say that the rest is for sure doing nothing, but those seem to be the biologically active parts. And unless, uh, so standardized extract means that uh, the manufacturer guarantees that, for example, is standardized to 70% of these active components. So uh, you write only Centella Asiatica extract on the ingredient list, but you can know that 70% of that is actually these active components. So that means standardized extracts. Uh, but most extracts are not standardized. And, and I love, as an example, Centella, because uh, we have looked at it in more detail. And there is one manufacturer where you can just buy, you know, a not standardized one where the manufacturer's claim is basically makes the skin more beautiful. Like there is like no claim whatsoever. The price is also like really one tenth, you know, of the, the other one. 
And then there is one where it's the 70% standardized extract. So there is like a 20 times price difference, like from 100 euro per kilogram, or I don't know, that's like 100 euro per pound. We go to like 2000 euro per pound. So huge price difference that's standardized. And then when you go to pure Madagascar side, it's like, again a double price difference like you go to like four thousand euro per pound and it's really because guaranteeing the active is so hard you need so many plants and you know it's not that one harvest lower quality and the other higher and these things so the manufacturer has to compensate for that so um so yeah um that's why i think like me as like a cosmetic formulator, I would prefer a product with, you know, just 0.1% Madagascar over like 80% Central Asiatica. For me, it does not say anything. For me, it actually says this brand is more about marketing than science. And uh, I do not feel that that it's, it's a claim that should be made. Uh, and interestingly, uh, like I feel that it's a marketing that really works. So even those who are into skin can love to see, okay, this contains 75% of, I don't know, hot leaf extract or this or that, uh, but it, re it means really little in, in practice. Yeah, I think that my experience testing a lot of products kind of backs that up. I've started to suspect the quality of some of these extracts being very uh, diff widely different. And I think, yeah, Centella is actually one of the best ones to to use as an example, because I have used, yeah, 100% Centella extract products. And I'm like, they're okay. And then I'll use, you know, maybe they're not making percentage claims, but they have the four active compounds of Centella in the ingredients list. And I'll be like, hey, this actually seems like it worked maybe a little better or faster, it had more calming, you know, um, anti-inflammation benefits that I've noticed. And so over time, I've kind of come to the conclusion that like there's a very wide variety of quality and just the ingredient Centella or even sometimes just those active compounds being present doesn't tell me how that product is going to perform because I don't know the source, the quality, um, the amount being used. And so, yeah, I can definitely see why it is is why you're you say it's a murky area of skincare and it is not very well understood i think also i've noticed that the extraction process can be different um, there's some products that i've tried that are very watery um, and there's some products i have tried that have almost like a, a smell like alcohol um, in it and even though that that's not listed in the ingredients list um, my guess is that the extraction happened in alcohol and yet um, and i'm very sensitive to that ingredient so it's like when that's not on the ingredients list but I'm feeling that on my face. I'm not a happy camper. <laughs> that does not make me happy. So um, I love that you that that we had we were able to talk about that because it's something that I've been suspicious about for a while. Um, just the the wide um, range of quality um, in plant yeah. extracts and how it's not standard. Yeah, and it's actually what I see. So I am a big fan of transparent active percentages in general. Actually, on in key decoder we have like a tag for that like known amount of active but so the beauty and skincare industry is so marketing heavy that now mm -hmm. i see that companies are inventing a more and more creative ways to make some kind of percentage claims that is really then like total bullshit and marketing only <laughs> and and plant extracts is is one of them but if we are already talking about it then i have to say a few others because it's a pet peeve of mine so saying x percent complex so if you see like five percent caramel complex for example then or anything complex it's just means basically nothing so i absolutely hate this word and I, i'm seeing more and more people use that because unless you know exactly what that complex is and you can check you know the manufacturer info then basically you have no idea what that means so uh, there is actually two correct ways that is meaningful for an active percentage one is to just 
defined the exact molecule, which is like a well-defined molecule, like retinol or retinol or metacastoside kind of thing. Or you can define the exact trade name. So 10% matrix bill, 3000, that's also okay. So here it's not the peptide that's 10%. Peptides are always used in the tiniest amounts. But you can just know what matrix cell 3000 is. You can check like the, the manufacturing or the composition of it. You can understand that, I don't know, usually 3% is the recommended amount. So 10% is like super high, maybe even too high, uh, stuff like that. So you can really take that information and check up on it and understand it. If you say 10% uh, peptide complex, uh, totally meaningless. Uh, mm -hmm. Or, um, yeah, plant extract. So, yeah, uh, anything like that. Or sometimes they say like 2.5% retinol, and it, it's like a whole like encapsulated retinol. So, you have like no idea how much retinol it is. So, yeah, you, you have to be careful about what's meaningful and what's marketing. Yeah, I think marketing loves those percentage claims. It's something easy for the consumer to to read and feel like they understand, oh, 3% this, 10% that, 10% is more, so it must be better than the 3%. Uh, I think that it's effective for selling products, but I think that it has actually left us more confused um, than uh, if we hadn't started doing that in the first place. Uh, since we're kind of talking about some of your pet peeves, um, I would love to uh, talk about shady ingredient lists and um, if there's any red flags that we should look out for I mean we've already kind of covered percentage claims about like undefined ingredients but I would love to hear you talk about um, some of the things maybe that you're flagging on inky decoder as a shady or a red flag in an ingredients list Yes, yeah, so we are seeing a surprising amount of ingredient lists that are just terrible, actually. So um, it can be, for example, using the common names of ingredients. So saying uh, olive oil or, uh, I don't know, aloe vera or whatever. So these are not like the inky names that is supposed to be written on the ingredient list. Uh, there are some more sciencey, trying to be sciencey brands that use trade names actually. So they will say matrix of 3000 on the ingredient list. And that's also not correct because mm. so that, that has actually a listing thing, water, glycerin, some glycol usually, then the two peptides and I don't know, some preservative. So these things has to be correctly like uh, listed out and then deduplicated. We also see so many uh, ingredient lists that are not correctly deduplicated, or I don't know how sh I should explain. So from multiple things come, I don't know, butylin glycol, and then it's listed like three times on different places on the ingredient list. That's also a warning sign. Um, what we also see often is that just the order of the ingredient list is like totally strange and impossible to be true. So, um, so ingredients up to the one percent mark has to be listed in in uh, descending order, and from one percent, uh, companies can list it uh, in any order they would like. Uh, but you know, a lot of ingredients just start with the, the best ingredient names and you know it, it just can be true so uh i don't know we see all kind of strange things like uh an ingredient list that lists uh water and things that are water soluble and then also oils but like no emulsifier at all so for me as a, as a cosmetic formulator that's, i'm also raising my eyebrow um yeah, I think if you are into skincare and love to look at ingredient lists, then, you know, the big companies like L'Oreal and Estee Lauder and so on, they really know how to do it. There are, of course, a bunch of trustworthy, really good, smaller indie brands as well. So if you're looking at good ingredient lists for a while, then, then you will start to pick up on, okay, this is really strange sounds too good to be true seems to, to miss like it it does not have these so-called helper ingredients a product has to have those you have to dissolve things you have to preserve things you have to make the emulsion work so it it cannot be all just nice sounding stuff so um yeah we, we see all kinds of shady things 
Yeah, I I love that about uh, Inky Decoder too, because if you're ever suspicious of your ingredients list, it's so easy to just pop that ingredients list into the website and kind of start to play around and say like, how is this possible? (laughs) You know, um, and then also you guys have some some flags in your system that you will um, say, hey, this is missing preservatives or um, this seems incomplete. And I love that because that, you know, and sometimes it's just an error on the the website of, that you're getting the ingredients list from but sometimes it's also telling us a bigger picture of like maybe yeah maybe it is kind of shady maybe it is just heavily marketed and they're not following the guidelines for the ingredients list um, they're not following those regulations so I, I love that you're actually flagging that because um, a lot of the ingredient websites that are out there aren't actually um doing that. Um, They'll tell you what the ingredients do, or they'll tell you different ratings and stuff, which are subjective, but um, they're not really flagging like, hey, this doesn't have preservatives. And that's kind of a red flag, right? Like you need your skincare to have preservatives, some type of system to preserve it. Yeah, so we do try to flag, though I'm not satisfied <laughs> with it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a hard process, hard to be always, you know, correct and everything. But yes, we try, we try to do that. But, I, I, but unfortunately, we are not like 100% reliable. So that's just a disclaimer that please yeah. know we, we are trying. But like, don't take it as it's 100% correct. Yeah, I imagine that can be like a very big undertaking too to create the system that would be able to grab every single ingredients list that feels shady, right? Um, I, I imagine that that would be difficult, but I think it's still, I still think it's a, a good effort because it it helps to hold um, those shady actors accountable. It, it helps to give us the, the power to say like, hey, wait a second. Um, and yeah, to ask more questions, not just take it maybe at face value. Um, I would love to talk about Geek and Gorgeous because this is a a skincare brand that you are a a co-founder of and you are also um, helping to create those products. Um, And I have to say that like I've tried some of the products. I'm a really big fan, especially of the moisturizers, Hydration Station and Happier Barrier. I recommend them a lot because they're like no nonsense. They get the job done. They have great ingredients and they feel really nice. And I have to say a lot of my my um, community asks me about like a geek and gorgeous a lot because it is um, something that really appeals to them. It is picking up in popularity and you've created these products. So I could not let you go (laughs) without asking you about your experience um, starting the brand, like how you approach formulating the products. And maybe if you've learned um, anything through the journey of creating these products, how that has informed maybe your other work as well. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I have not talked about Geek and Gorgeous uh, yet, but, you know, when I created the Hungarian website that I talked about uh, in the beginning, then thanks to that, I got to know um, the owner and CEO of um, a very traditional big mass market brand here in Hungary, and we ended up uh, creating a brand together. And that's geek and gorgeous. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I had a lot of learnings and a lot of surprises. And so I find product development is really difficult. I think it's kind of like cooking. So you can cook on some level easily, so to say, but you know, cooking on like a Michelin star level is yeah. really difficult. And and I feel this is the situation with skincare and skincare brand that uh, so many there are so many formulations and so many brands just quickly do something without too much thought. But if you want a, a really a beautiful formula, uh, then it's a quite a difficult process. And also one of my biggest learnings since, um, you know, studying cosmetic science and formulating was that before I was thinking, oh, you just should check the first five ingredients, that's the maturity of the product. And, you know, under the 1% line, it doesn't even count. And it turns out so many ingredients are used under 1%. So mm. actually, I think, especially the more uh, complicated, like longer ingredient list product, the majority of the ingredients there is really under 1%. And 
And I'm not only talking about actives. So there are tons of actives that are used in tiny amounts like peptides, but even like uh, retinol, 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 uh, but even the standardized plant extracts, so standardized plant extracts are always super expensive, as I mentioned already. They are always just used at a couple of tens percentages, um, but also like reality modifiers. So these are ingredients that thicken up the fine and 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 uh, uh, modify the rheology. These are really important for the skin feel of the product, and they are just used at tiny amounts usually, so very rarely above one percent. Like for example, xanthan gum. We just have had an experience that you know it's kind of a best practice to put zero point two percent xanthan gum into an emulsion, it just makes it more stable and 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 uh, everything. Um, and, and we are working on a sunscreen for a very long time. And I was like, okay, something that I think is just out there. We are collaborating with an external lab there and they put it there. And I was like, it's probably not important. Let's just take it out. And it was completely different oh, product, no. like completely <laughs> changed. So we were like, okay, wow. So this is not there, just out of habit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so many of these, and also like stabilizers, you know, like the sodium edata. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right in English, but it's like a chelating agent, which just helps to avoid discoloration if you are using certain kind of actives. And these are all used in tiny percentages, but are all really meaningful in the formulation. So yeah, maybe I would say this is the biggest learning, how many things you use in this tiny amount and they are still totally meaningful. Yeah, I love the analogy of cooking because I love to cook. And I would say one of the most important ingredients, no matter what you're making, is salt. And yet it is used at the smallest amount. But if you don't put the salt in or if you don't put the right amount in, again, a very small portion compared to everything else you're using, it completely changes the dish. So um, I think that that's an amazing analogy, uh, especially to, to finding out that like every little piece of the ingredients list is doing something and um, that it's, it's important to, to take the whole thing into consideration. Um, and sometimes being used in the tiniest amount makes or breaks uh, the texture or the performance um, and how something works. So that was actually really enlightening. I love that. I love that you're learning too. Like as you're like getting into formulating, it's like, hey, I'm kind of changing my mind about a lot of the stuff I knew about ingredients. I think that that's um, such a cool experience. Every product and, you know, every ingredient we start to work with, we really learn something new. So so uh, un, as I think until you actually work with an ingredient, you, you, you don't know practically that much. So, yeah, it's, it's totally different to just read read about it or see the, the, the manufacturer claims, which are so often, you know, the manufacturers are trying to market to us, cosmetic formulators, and, you know, their claims are... Uh, similarly overblown as then how companies do uh, big marketing claims to to the users so yeah it's always super interesting to start to work with a new ingredient we always learn so much (laughs) there are always surprises yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It has been such a pleasure learning from you. Um, I This was, like I said, I'm such a big fan of Inky Decoder and of uh, Geek and Gorgeous. So just to be able to talk to you was really an honor. Can you please share with listeners where we can connect with you further, where we can find your work? Um, so if you're searching Geek and Gorgeous, then you will find us. We are on TikTok and Instagram and Inky Decoder. Um, you can find it on the internet, our website, or we also have an Instagram account, even though due to lack of energy, it's not active, but uh, we hope it will be one day. So uh, yeah, these, these places basically. Perfect. Thank you again so much. 
What a fantastic conversation. I hope you learned just as much from it as I did. If you love the conversation, please share it with anyone you know. Share it with your family, your friends. Share it with your social media communities. Share it so that we can become smarter consumers of our skincare products. If you love the conversation and you're listening on Spotify, I would love it if you take a moment to just rate the podcast with stars. If you're on Apple Podcasts, you can rate it with stars, or if you can write a few sentences and review the show, just a few sentences about how you're enjoying the podcast. Not only does it help new listeners find the show, it actually helps me book new guests as well because it really shows that the, the podcast is making an impact on you. If you're watching on YouTube, hey, give it a big thumbs up and um, definitely hit subscribe to get some more Unpacking Beauty content from me. I have a lot of great episodes lined up for you, but I want to hear your episode or guest suggestions as well. If you're listening on Spotify, answer the Q&A with your suggestions. If you're watching on YouTube, just drop it right below in the comments. Thank you so much for being here with me today, and I'll see you in the next episode of Unpacking Beauty coming out in two weeks. Talk to you soon.